Father, we've gathered together tonight around your holy word. And Lord, the prophet Kenneth Copeland said that in these last days that you're pouring out revelation faster than the ministers can preach it. And Lord, I testify that what he's saying is true. Prayer time has been shortened. And Brother uh, Jerry Seville says God's in a hurry. And he's, in a, he's wanting to have revelation in his church to prepare us for this great outpouring, the great breaking loose of the Holy Spirit in these last days. And so, Father, I am so grateful. I don't take you for granted. I still uh, meet with you early, and I begin to pray. And you are so quick to give me revelation and instructions and directions and commandments that I spend the rest of the time just in praise and meditation. So, Lord, I just want the people to know that you're pouring out revelation to any whosoever has a desire to hear from God. His voice is loud and clear, and he's speaking to whosoever has ears to hear in these last days. So, Father, I thank you for this word tonight, and I want to be certain that you get all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Would you open your Bibles with me tonight to John's Gospel, chapter 3? I was praying yesterday, like I say, I just start to pray, and, and, and he starts talking. Uh, it just I used, I used to have to pray two hours and then meditate for two hours and man now things are happening so fast I came in this morning to pray for for the Sunday service I didn't pray one minute and the Lord took me into a scripture and began to show me things I've not seen before and I thought I said Lord now just you gotta let me just gotta give me some time to let me praise with you here a little bit because this is just so it is just so awesome that things are happening so fast. Amen. Amos, amen. So I was praying, and the Lord brought this scripture to me. It's in John 3.34. All of a sudden, I had, I had nothing, in, nothing up in the upper story, nothing in my head. What else is new? And, I, and all of a sudden, this scripture comes to my, comes to, in my spirit. And it, it, you know, I, I don't know if you know the scripture or not, but John 3.34, for whom God has sent that's Jesus, speaks the words of God, for God gives not the Spirit by measure unto him. Now, I've read this scripture many, many times, and I have heard people teach on this scripture many, many times. And I've heard a lot of diverse teachings, and one of the teachings that seem to be the most prevalent is that only Jesus had the Holy Spirit without measure. And everybody else has a, a reduced amount or a limited supply of the Holy Spirit. And they go on to say, because Jesus had to do things that no other man could do. And so he had to have a greater measure of the Spirit. And I've heard that and, um, and I never really uh, took it into my spirit. I just, hmm. Because I just don't know, and I like I say, I've heard a lot of strange teachings on this where, you know, only Jesus had the Holy Spirit and because he had things to do. And uh, But that word measure there put limits. God put no limits on him. And so when I came in to pray yesterday, the Lord brings the scripture up into my spirit, and then, and then, he, with, then he begins to explain what he's saying here. And I just sit in there, oh... Oh, uh, and, as, and as usual, men seem to complicate the Bible. And when he explained it, I said, Lord, that's so simple. So um, I want to uh, launch off of this scripture <clears throat> and explain it to you. And, you know, I don't like teaching the Bible where you think, well, that was wonderful. Because if you don't find your place in here, what good is it? You've got to find your place in the scriptures. And so we'll find our place in the scripture. So just keep in mind that most people teach that Jesus was the only one who had the Holy Spirit without measure, without limits. Now, go ahead, and if you would, please, to John's, uh, we're still in, in John's gospel, chapter 20, and uh, verse 19. Now, Jesus 
uh, has risen from the dead. And his uh, disciples are locked down in the upper room. And so we'll pick this up uh, in John uh, 2019. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. See, the, the disciples thought Jesus, they knew he died. They had no faith for the resurrection, even though he told them he would destroy this tabernacle in three days and I'll raise it up. He did not, they did not believe that he would be risen from the dead. So, um, so now they're locked in there for fear of the Jews. And then came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. <clears throat> and when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. This is when, when they seen him, then they believed. Now, and now their fear is beginning to leave because now if Jesus rose from the dead, that means everything he said was true. And so in that one encounter, that fear they had began to ebb and the peace of God came in. So, you know, when God, uh, God will not tell you to be at peace unless he didn't provide for that, for that uh, anoint, anointing of peace. So now they, now remember, everybody always talks about doubting Thomas. They all doubted. They, none of them believed that he rose from the dead. In fact, when Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to the two women and they, he said, go tell Peter and my disciples I rose from the dead. Well, they, the two ladies went and told the disciples and they wouldn't believe the women. And so when Jesus got into them, he got in their face. He said, I sent these handmaidens to tell you, and you didn't believe them. Amen. Praise God. Thank God for the women. Amen. One woman said, amen. Hmm. All right, ladies, I gave you a chance. Now, and then in verse 21, then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you. As my father has sent me, even so I send you. Now, once again, that scripture comes into our, our thinking. If Jesus is sending us in the same, to do the same thing he did, how much of the spirit is he going to allot to us? If he had it without measure, what are we going to have? All right, and then verse 22, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Now, when a man, I'm going to make a statement, and I'm going to reverse it, and it'll come out the same, you'll see. When a man has the Holy Spirit, he will believe. Or you could say it this way, when a man believes, he has the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, when he breathed on them, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit, what they received here was the new birth. They were born again. Okay. Amen. They were born again. Praise God. Are you still with me now? Yeah. Okay, fine. So when he breathed on them, they got born again. They, and, and it says the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to note here that they did not speak in other tongues. He just breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And they could do this because they believed on him because they seen him. All right, so now they're born again. Praise God. Now, let's go ahead there to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 3. And there's a scripture that we use quite often in intercessory prayer. And it's important scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 3. Paul later wrote about this event when Jesus breathed on them, and he said in, in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, Therefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Holy Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse. But here's what I want you to see. Though no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. So now they received the Holy Spirit, and now they identify Jesus as the Savior or the Lord of their lives. Praise God. Now, no man can be saved without the Holy Spirit. Now, here I want to say that 
when he breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit, they received the Holy Spirit in measure. Amen? They received a measure of the Holy Spirit and it caused them to be born again, to become, uh, the Bible says they were first called Christians. <clears throat> Praise God. All right, now, now let's go to Acts chapter two. We still have not answered that question yet, but we'll answer it right here. When he breathed on them, they received the Holy Spirit by measure. All right, now approximately 40 days and I could be off a few days, but it's not, it won't change what, we're, what I'm going to share with you here. About 40 days later, now they're gathered together. There's 120 of them. And if you read the scriptures, you'll see there's men, women, men and women. And anytime you have men and women, you got children. But there's 120 people gathered. And in, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all of one accord in one place. They all believed that Jesus rose from the dead, one accord. That's not talking about a Honda. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire sat upon each of them, and they were all filled, filled, filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Praise God. So now, um, now they're all filled. Now, if you're full of the Holy Spirit, there's nothing left. <clears throat> and so now we go back to that scripture in John. We don't have to turn there. But he says, the Spirit was given him without measure. It's given to all those who are filled with the Holy Spirit without measure. We have the same measure of the Holy Spirit that Jesus had. How can we, now, now the, the, the Holy, his ministry was different than ours because none of us are called to be the saviors of the world. Amen. Yes. But we are called to be little Christs, little anointed ones. Praise God. That's what Christian is. It's Christ-like, a Christ person. Praise God. So the answer to that question is that the the people who have the Holy Spirit by measure are the people who have received the witness of the Holy Spirit to be born again. They have the Holy Spirit by measure. But when you get baptized in the Holy Ghost and you're filled, then you there's no limits. You got the same measure as Christ. When I was over at 180 last year, I I brought a bowl over and then I brought a pitcher and I brought a cup. And I told the kids, I says, now, and I took this cup, and I, and I says, now, when you receive Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes into your life. And I poured the cup half full. And I says, you have the Holy Spirit. But now, when you get baptized with the Holy Ghost, and you get filled, then I took that pitcher, and I began to fill that cup, and I just kept filling till it overflowed. So if you, if you guys fill your coffee cups, you know, you say fill her up, it'll be about an eighth of an inch below the lip. But when God fills something up, it just keeps flowing over, flowing over. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living waters. Praise God. So the answer to John chapter 3 is that, yes, God gave Jesus the spirit without measure, and he gives those who believe the spirit without measure as well. Praise God. Now, so, um, so when you're filled, you're filled. There's nothing left. There's no, there's nothing, there's no more of the Holy Spirit he can give you if you're full. Glory to God. I love being filled with the spirit. Hallelujah. Okay, now let's go back to John's gospel, chapter 14. John 14 and 12. Now, you know this scripture. Because see, Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, I send you. Well, we could not do what Jesus wants us to do if we had the Holy Spirit by measure. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to turn up half of the power. You're only gonna, you can only have half of the Holy Ghost. Well, I don't know if the Holy Ghost fragments himself or not. I don't think so. 
Now in John's 14 and 12, then it says, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say unto you, who that believes on me, the works that I do, he'll do also, and greater works than these will do because I go unto my Father. Now, if we were given the Holy Spirit by measure, we could not do the works of Jesus, nor we could do greater works. Praise God. How could we do greater works if we're given the Spirit by measure? We can't. But now, uh, I was meditating this scripture, and we, we, we're we not going to be credited without performing Jesus. Now, he says, greater works than these you will do, but we're not going to outperform him. We're not going to get to heaven, and he'll say, oh, man, you guys did more miracles than me. You did this, you did that. He's not going to say that. You know why? Because we're using his name. His spirit, his name, and so he's still getting credit. Or or we call the glory. We when we give God the credit, we're actually giving him the glory, you know. And I, I just as a how would I say, just come up in my spirit if if um if you want to lose your anointing stop taking the start taking the glory for yourself yeah. start start projecting yourself as being somebody yeah. and that anointing will the measure will, will slip down drastically praise mm -hmm. god because god will not share, share his glory with any man right. glory to god and that's what really if you approach praise and worship correctly you are giving god glory mm -hmm. thank you lord and and you know what uh this is still, I can't get off of this one. If you really want to praise the Lord and worship him um, to the max, then do it in your own words. Don't borrow somebody else's. Go to him and tell him how much you appreciate what he did for you. And, and I'll tell you what will happen if you try that. You'll, you'll get to the place where and I've done. I've tried this. I said, Lord, I, I cannot put into English words how much I love you because I recognize what you did, and I cannot tell you in my own words how much I love you and appreciate you. And the next thing I said, the only way I can exp I can express myself is speak in tongues, and then the, because then the Holy Spirit will take what you're feeling, what you're thinking, and He'll minister it to the Lord. My gosh, this is some good teaching. Man, oh man. Praise God. God gets the glory. Don't, don't misunderstand me. Hallelujah. He, I, he, we're flowing with the Holy Spirit now. Praise God. All right, now, let's go back to Psalm 78. And I want to pick up something. Now, how many know... Um, and you can read it in, and I think it's in 1 Corinthians 10, where the, the, Paul begins to list some of the errors and the mistakes of the Jews out in the wilderness. And then he says, these were given as examples that we don't follow after the same habit of uh, making the same mistakes. And so when you go back and you read what happened to Israel, it's not an occasion to put them down and say, you stupid Jews or anything like that, but rather that you take note of what they did wrong so you don't follow after the same example of unbelief. So now, and that's what Psalm 78 and verse 40 is. He's, he, uh, the, the psalmist says, how oft did they, the Jews, provoke God in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? Yes, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They remembered not his hand nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. So when they began to question God and they forsook what he did and they forgot about him, they began to put limits on him. Amen. You know, then this is, well, you know, uh, God don't hear my prayers. Well, that's not really the problem. The problem is you're not giving him due honor. You're not giving him the fear that him and him alone uh, is owed. So when, when God's people oppose him, 
we put limits on him. Amen. Remember when he went into his hometown and he, and he said he, he laid hands on a few sick folk. But and one translation says, but very few got healed. And so he marveled at their unbelief. They limited him because they didn't believe. And so they put limits. And, you know, here's now think about this. Here's Jesus, the son of God. He's been given the Holy Spirit without measure. And he can't release that power because of their unbelief. And so, you know, a lot of people do that. They want to they want to blame God. It's, it's not me. Of course, I don't. It's not me. I'm not the one having the problem. It's got to be God. Listen, I've learned a long time ago from Kenneth Copeland. He says, you know, if something's not working, then it comes down to one of two things. Either God's missing it or we're missing it. And if we have a choice, I'd pick me. <laughs> Amen. And I've, I've had to pray that way. God, I prayed. Nothing happened. And I know you're not missing it, so what am I doing wrong? Right. Praise God. And, you know, when God corrects you, you know, sometimes if you got yourself a little tood going on, a little pride thing going on, you don't like to be corrected. But he has such a way of correcting you that you're just, he just leaves you with a residue of love. Yeah. <laughs> and you just want to just want to bow down. Thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. Thank you for correcting me. And he's, and it, no matter how he says it, it just, you're so grateful. Praise God. Years ago, the Lord told me something. He said, now, son, he says, if somebody corrects you, you'll benefit. If somebody criticizes you, they'll benefit. I thought, okay. So uh, the title of my Bible study tonight is, Who Limits the Holy One? Now the Holy One is in us, praise God. And, and we've been given the Holy Spirit without measure. We're filled with the same Spirit that Jesus was filled with. But it, it, he's not, he, he, his hands aren't tied. You know, he can only do so much. He could only do so much for Israel because they didn't believe. He brought out two and a half, approximately two and a half million, give or take, 100 to 200,000 or so, out of Egypt, to go to the promised land, they say it's like a seven or 10 day march. And they were out in the desert for over 40 years. And of out of that two and a half million, only two made it because they limited God. Now here's God with all this power and they, they, couldn't, uh, they couldn't use it because of their unbelief. Praise God. So there's certain things that we have to watch for that we don't put limitations on God. Praise God. You know, there's there's people that you pray for and, you know, and, you know, you're filled with the Holy Spirit and it's the Father in you that does the works. Yes. Amen. But I don't know if maybe I probably fees experienced this, but sometimes you go to pray for people and you feel the anointing go and come right back. It does not penetrate them. And they're, they're just not at a place where they can receive. And that's what happened to Jesus in his hometown. And so rather than shake the dust off his feet, he went about teaching. Amen. See, teaching prepares you to receive. That's why the word of God is so very important. It's the word that prepares us. I'm listening to Kenneth Hagin in my uh, car now. I'm going back listening to him again. And, and he's talking about when he used to do meetings, he'd go into a place He'd, he'd go from two to seven weeks into one place. And he said in most churches, he would go in there and begin to teach them the word of God. And, and he would teach them and teach them and teach them. And, and, there would, and the signs and wonders would start off kind of small degree. But as the people received and they began to expect, then the signs and wonders became greater and greater. And so by the end of those meetings, there were all kinds of uh, super miracles and, and all kinds of things that took place. Praise God. Hallelujah. And see that all the churches are supposed to have this supernatural power. But the, and they, they just, somebody has to demonstrate it so that they know that there's more than what they have. Praise God. So they began under the power of God 
but all but two of them died in the wilderness. All right, now let's go uh, to Matthew's gospel, chapter 17. There's, um, there's just a, a oh, I, I'd hate to, I don't like putting numbers on things, but there's about four things that we need in our lives if we are going to permit that power to flow. Praise God. And we, you learn these things by the mistakes that other people in the scriptures, that God had these things. Because, you know, why would God want failure to be printed in the Bible so we don't follow after the same example of unbelief? So in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 19, I'm a little bit short. I've got to go another chapter. 17. Okay. Um, let me set this up for you. Um, Jesus comes on the scene. There is a man there that says, um, Master, he says, my son's a lunatic. He calls him a loony, a lunatic. And what we, what we believe is an epileptic spirit. And he says, my son has a spirit. And oftentimes the spirit throws him in the water and throws him in the fire and tries to kill him, I'm paraphrasing. And he says, I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't cast him out. And he says, if you can do anything, help me. So then Jesus uh, walked up to that kid, and as soon as he did, he threw himself in the fire, and he's wallowing and spitting and stuff. And uh, Jesus asked him, how long has he had this, this spirit? He said, since he's a little kid. And then Jesus says, hold your peace and come out and, and, and rent him not. Well, that spirit came out, and then the kid just laid there like he was dead, and then Jesus raised him up. Well, then afterward, now listen, this is so very important. In, in Matthew 17 and 19, then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could not we cast him out? Now, I don't know if you caught that, but when we make a mistake, when we misappropriate the word, we don't use it correctly and nothing happens, what do we want to do? We want to blame the person. We want to blame doctor. We want to blame everything. But the disciples were very wise because they came to Jesus and says, why didn't this work? Because we know you gave us your name and we, we used the name Jesus, but we couldn't get him out. What did we do wrong? Man, Folks, don't ever be afraid to go to God and tell him you missed it. Amen. If you don't go to him and talk to him, you know what gonna, you're going to do? You're going to continue to miss it. You're going to get discouraged and stuff. This stuff don't work. I can remember one time where there was a lady that we went to church with at Faith Tabernacle, just a sweet lady, and she got this disease, I, I don't CPMS or something, and they put her in a nursing home, and she's dying. So Barbara Schmehill, me, and that fee went up there, and we prayed for her at the old St. John's Hospital up on Broadway, whatever it is. And we went in there, and we prayed for her. I don't know if you remember this, but you probably prayed for so many people and remember. But we went in there, and I'm, I'm high on my faith because I've been hearing the word. And we laid hands on her, and we prayed that she would live and not die, and she'd get up out of that bed and walk. And we left, man, I was just, praise God, hallelujah, and three days later she died. And, and then when that happened, here comes the devil. And he said, see, this stuff don't work. It doesn't work for everybody. The days of miracles passed away. It don't work. And I'm thinking, yeah, because and there's evidence right there. It's not working. And so I went to Barbara Schmehel. She was our mentor. And I says, I says Barbara, I... She says, what's wrong with you? Why are you moping? I says, well, we prayed for her. And Barbara, I prayed in faith. I know I did. And I know you and Fee did. I know we prayed in faith, but how come she died? And she, she's so wise. And she's, she looked at me and said, Jerry, who's the healer? You or God? And I, and I, I, I had, come on, who is it? I says, God. Then says, shut up. You stop that moping around. You don't know what the details are. You, you, you did what you were supposed to do, and you keep doing what you're supposed to do. 
Praise God. And it, I don't know why she died. To this day, I don't. Yeah. I don't know. But, I, but you know, God does. And he's the healer, not us. And that really, you know, when she told me that, that day forward, it set me free. It took a lot of pressure off of me because we get to this place that we, you know, have all this knowledge and people expect me to perform. You should never lead people to think that you can perform. It's the, it's the spirit in you without measure. He does the works. Because even Jesus had the spirit without measure as we do. And he could do no mighty works there because of their unbelief. Okay, so now they come to Jesus and they ask him, why couldn't we cast him out? All right, now verse 20, Jesus is going to tell them. And Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. Well, you know, if, if I can't get something because of unbelief, you know what? I know what I need to go work on. Instead of thinking, well, I, I've been wondering for 40 years why that didn't work. For truly I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mount, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. So what Jesus is saying is, he says, you know, it, faith is just a small thing. He says, it's, it's your faith in me, not in what you can do. Not in your, you know, hey, I've got, a, I've got a good track record of casting out devils. This one will go. Man, I couldn't get that devil out. Well, you are begin to uh, put yourself in a place that only Jesus can be. Glory to God. Are you, are you here? Are you still here? So one of the first, one of the things that we need to take the limits off of God is faith. Without faith, we will put limits on what God wants to do. Amen. Praise God. He could do no mighty works because of their unbelief. And, and he's had the Holy Spirit without measure, just like us. But he could not do what God sent him to do. Praise the Lord. So, the, so one of the elements we need is faith. Now, go back, and if you would please, to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. And I'm just going to take something out of context. And it will, um, I'll tell you the next element that we need to deal with if we're going to let the Holy Spirit in us without measure to come out and do the works that, uh, greater works than Jesus through his name. Peter, in 1 Peter 3, 7, he says, Now you husbands, dwell with them, in, dwell with your wives, according to knowledge or according to what the word says, not, not what the marriage counselor says, but what the word says, giving honor unto the wife as under the weaker vessel. Now, women might be a little weaker physically, might. Some of them are pretty strong, but they might be. But that's about the only place they're weak in. Amen. I was talking to Lisa today. She comes in and does... Uh, part-time help help Mandy do some of the paperwork in the office and and she says don't you think that women are quicker to receive the word than men and I says I, I says I can't go along with that because it would make me look bad <laughs> and she says well it's true isn't it and I says yeah I think it is true in most cases and that women are more receptive you know, in fact, and I told her about, you know, Jesus appeared to those two ladies and told them, you know, they didn't have no doubt at all. And they went and told the disciples, we ain't going to, we don't believe that. Praise God. So uh, women might be weaker in some cases physically, but that's the only place. So he says, draw them according to honor as under the weaker vessel and be an heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. So um, if, we miss, if we abuse people, our prayers can be hindered. Amen. And, and we could just put it under the category of sin. We cannot harm people and belittle them and put them down and, and do all these things against them. And, and James is very clear about that. They're created in the similitude of man. With our tongue, we bless God and curse men, and they're made in the same similitude of God. God does, uh, you know, the, the, they came to him and he says, now we, they says, now Jesus, we know God does not hear the prayers of sinners. And so 
you know, uh, if we're going to let that power that's in us out, we have to lead, live a sanctified life. You can't have um, sinful habits in your life. And it's just, I always like to use the illustration of a battery in your car. That battery could be fully charged, which is representative of the Holy Spirit. But if the terminal's going from the battery to the engine and they're dirty, the power can't flow. And cleaning them is really easy. You don't even have to take them to a mechanic. That's about the only thing you can do on your car anymore. <laughs> Praise God. And, and that's why, you know, Joe McCroskey has taught me when I come in on Sunday mornings, first thing I do is go to the altar and just repent. I said, Lord, I, I come before I repent of every sin, known and unknown, anything, everything that was an offense to you and anybody else. I just ask you to wash them out of my life and make me fit for the master's use. I'm just cleaning my, my, uh, my terminals. I don't have a sin consciousness. You know, if there's specific things I've done, uh, the best time to repent is immediately. And so they're taken out. But I'm just, just, uh, I'm just tuning up my, uh, my body so the Lord has a clean vessel to flow out of. And, and the Bible talks about that in Timothy, about being vessels of honor. Praise God. You know, I, I prayed for the lady at the golf course that had that seizure and I cast the devil out of her and, and she got up and, and she came back and she hugged me and called me her savior and I corrected her and all that. And we became fast friends. Well then, you know, but, but she's, they're liberals. And, they, and they, they don't, and I'm not saying that in the, from a political sense, but it is, it works that way too. But they don't have a relationship with the Lord. They're Christians, but carnal Christians. And she doesn't understand why, you know, they, we buy you a beer. And I says, well, no, but could I have the money instead? And they won't give me the money. <laughs> and this was it a sin? I says, no. But, you know, I, and I try to tell her, I says, I have to keep this vessel clean because if you have another seizure, I'm going to have to cast the devil at you and get you free. <laughs> Amen. So, you know, the Bible says, be instant in season, ready to minister at all times. Praise God. It only takes a minute to get to keep your life. Just, you know, just lead a life of repentance all the time and don't let the devil get a foothold in your life. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. So, so there's, there's two things that can limit the, the power that's in us, the faith. If we don't have faith, if there's some sin going on. Now, the, the next one, and we got two more, and then we'll be done. Look over to James chapter 5 and uh, verse 16. James 5 and 16. Oh, I love this scripture. James 5, 16. Listen to what James uh, tells, the, tells us here. Confess your faults one to another or your trespasses and pray for one another. You may be healed. But here's the part that I really like. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. But now listen... Listen to the Amplified. I love the Amplified. The earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its workings. So the third one there is prayer. If you, if you believe and you've taken care of any kind, if you had any sin issue, take, now the next thing is prayer. I love that earnest felt, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. So the power of the Holy Spirit is released in prayer. Praise God. When you, when you pray according to the word of God, the Holy Spirit does the works. Kenneth Copeland has said this for years. I've heard him say it personally and I've heard him on CDs. He says, all of our failures are on account of a lack of prayer. He says, that's where you can trace back your failures is a lack of prayer. Did you pray? Did you, did you, because prayer is where, prayer is like, is your conference call to Jesus? I mean, Lord, what do you want me to do? I, I love coming in and I say, Lord, now I'm teaching Bible study tomorrow night. As I said this yesterday, I'm teaching tomorrow, uh, Bible study tomorrow night. 
<clears throat> and I'm, I don't, I don't know where you want me to go. I don't know what you want us to learn or study about, but I'm here to submit what you want. And I'm, it, it just takes minutes. And he's, he starts talking to me about that John 3, 34, about the spirit without measure. And I said, Lord, I've never understood that scripture. He says, you will. And we just took off. So, so then now that you've got the Holy Spirit without measure, prayer is releasing him. Pray for one another. The fervent heartfelt sexual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Praise God. I don't, I'm, I'm convinced that we really don't fully have a revelation of how just effective our prayers have been. Now, if I may say this without flattering Aunt Feve too much, she had a burden for Catholics and my family, and so she fasted for 40 days. Into that fast, all, all my Catholic family all got saved. There's a bunch of us. I don't remember how many were there, sis. I know she had to pray extra for you, but. Amen. The fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous woman availeth much. Praise God. All right. Last one is in Ephesians chapter 3. Now, now he, uh, here's, a place to, here, here's a place to enter into error. Well, why don't we just start a doctrine where we all just pray for 40 days for all the Catholics? Well, if God don't lead you to do that, then, he, then you're missing his plan because he probably has another one. I'm sure he does. Now, the last element that we need to have that power without measure released from us in Ephesians chapter 3, look at verse 14. Paul writes, he says, For this reason I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, I humble myself in adoration, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. We're, we're named after God. That he should grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Where does your strength come from? The Lord in the inner man. By his spirit. The spirit is the power of God. Look at verse 17, that Christ with the anointed one and his anointing may dwell in your hearts by faith that you be rooted and grounded in love. Love, love is the last thing. Love is what makes a Subaru. <laughs> but, it, but in the Bible, it makes people whole. Subarus can't do that. And it says, and in verse 18, that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, depth, and height, or the dimensions of God's love, that you may comprehend it. And I'm going to tell you right up now, you cannot comprehend the love of God. You can't do it. Try to, try to figure out why he would save a wretch like me. You know, or you can put your name in there. Why would God save a wretch like me? And I, 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 would, I would spend hours, I said, Lord, look at all the stuff I did. And, and now you want to just save me and you don't want me to, I don't have to earn it. I don't have to do works. He just, just saved me. I said, I don't understand that. And your head just goes till, till, till. And you're trying, and he says that you can comprehend the dimensions of his, of his love. But then, but, and then but look at verse 19. And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. So you can't, you can't figure it out, but you can embrace it. You can have a relationship with his love, even though you can't figure out why he sheds his love on us. And what it ultimately ends up doing is just worshiping him, thanking him. Yeah. As Lord, I don't know why you'd save a wretch like me, mm -hmm. but man, I, I just, I just got to worship you. I just got to praise you. So the, the love God has towards us is beyond human comprehension. It's the love of God is, and see, here's where you get into trouble is you try to compare it to human kind of love. You know, you've heard me to say the human kind of love is performance-based. You do something nice for me, I love you. You do something bad, I don't love you. But God says, I don't care if you do good or bad, I love you. And I says, well, how? That, that doesn't make sense. Of course it doesn't. 
because it's not human. It's supernatural. But God can impart his love to you and you can love beyond your reason. And I, I've, I've done that and I'm thinking, that's not me. That's, that's not how I... That's not how I was raised. You know, my family was my family was the best at carrying grudges. And then all of a sudden, I can forgive this guy who don't deserve it. And I'm thinking, what's happened to me? You know, I, this, this is beyond my comprehension. That's what he says there. It's beyond knowledge and be filled with the fullness of God. And then look, the last scripture is at verse 20. Now, now that you have this love working with you, now unto him, that's God, who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to that power that works in us. That's the love of, and the Holy Spirit without measure. He can do more than we, we cannot comprehend just what he can do. What if, if we think what we think God could do, you know, he can do more than that. I used to, uh, I, I was praying one day and I got this revelation. I used to share it with Wendell. How many, have, how many have met Wendell? One, two, oh, quite a few of you have, okay. So Wendell is Jeff's dad. And so I was talking to Wendell one day and I says, Wendell, I says, you know that the Holy Spirit is faster than a speeding bullet. He can leap over tall buildings in a single bound. And yet he'd make a very poor athlete. He says, what? He says, what do you mean by that? I says, well, with all this power he has, he'd make a very poor athlete. And he says, why is that? I says, because he won't compete with men. Wendell says, oh, yeah. Wendell loved that. He, he, he was always quoting it back to me. Praise God. So that love is not for competition. It's to, it's to, we can do everything with the love of God. I mean, it's just amazing. So, the power that's within us without measure because it flows from God's love. You know, um, like Kenneth, or like it was a Kenneth Hagen, I think, was said that, or Kenneth Copeland, he said, God would heal people that I would never heal. If it was up to me, I wouldn't heal them. <laughs> His power is far beyond what we can imagine. Praise God. I like, remember when Jesse Duplantis was here, he was telling us, he says, these people are giving him fits. And, uh, and so the Lord says, Jesse, you have to love these people. And he says, and he says, Lord, he says, I don't like these people. And the Lord says, Jesse, I don't like them either. But I died for them. Yeah. <laughs> and so Jesse says, okay, I, I repent. So love has no limits. It's not measured by degrees. We limit God if we let, if we give ourselves to sin without repentance, or if we don't have faith because of our unbelief, or if we um, we don't give ourselves to prayer, or if we don't walk in love, those are the things that would limit the Holy One. But it's not it's not the Holy Spirit that's limited; it's that we limit Him. Praise God. So who would limit the Holy One? Not me. Not you. Praise God. Well, Father. I've taught the word tonight and I perceive in my spirit that the people are receptive, that they're just as hungry for move of the spirit as I am, Lord. I thank you for revelation knowledge. I thank you, Lord, that you've given us the spirit without measure that we can do the works of God. And I thank you, Lord, that we um, make a good home for the holy guest, the Holy Spirit, our holy guest, that he has a home that he loves to be in, that he can work out of that he can flow out of, that he can do the works of God. Lord, we want to be certain that you get all the praise and all the glory because it's your spirit and your name and your love. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Um, I don't know if there's somebody here or somebody who's going to view this on the Internet, but somebody's been dealing with dizzy spells. And I just rebuke those dizzy spells off of your body right now in the name of Jesus. This, this has something to do with blood pressure or, or something like that. 
and it, it's bringing those, it, those dizzy spells come and go. I, I command your blood pressure to be at the proper level. I command your heart to beat perfectly and properly, that your high blood, that the, the blood pressure be normal and perfect right now in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Has anybody here been experienced a dizziness? Okay. Well, you're healed in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Praise God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, bless these people mightily. Confirm the word in them with signs following. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.